So when you're installing a synthetic stay, this is it. This is the whole thing. Put the stay into the toggle. You put the clevis pin through the toggle. Then you put a cotter pin or cotter ring on the clevis pin. And then you're done. Now it's important when you put these in, the clevis pin goes head up if there is ever an upside. And the reason is, like right now, there's no cotter pin in this. The head, because of gravity, keeps it from falling out. So after coming down from the mast, getting your shower, resting, now it's time to tension the stays that you've just recently installed. So I'm going to be doing it with just dead eyes. I don't have turnbuckles, and that is for two reasons. One, uh, turnbuckles have stainless steel components which can get crevice corrosion and then fail. And crevice corrosion is actually really hard to spot and find. Like it, it takes a really trained eye and it's really easy to miss it even with a trained eye. So having just a Dyneema dead eye, there's no stainless steel, or correction, there is less stainless steel to need to inspect to be concerned about hidden crevice corrosion. So that's reason number one. And then reason number two, which is the main reason for us, is cost. A turnbuckle for our size of boat costs about $100 per turnbuckle. And when you have 11 of them, that's expensive. Uh, the dead eyes cost me about $24 in materials to make. So when you factor that up times 11, that's a lot less than what it would have been for turnbuckles. So that's why we have dead eyes. Uh, it's not that I'm against turnbuckles or anything like that, because if you have stainless steel, you just have to inspect it. It's something you're going to be doing. Now with stainless steel, with a turnbuckle, all you need to do at this point is attach the eye to the turnbuckle and then tension the, the bottle screw back to where it was. That's it. Yeah, there's, it, it's just like regular rigging. There's nothing fancy or complicated to it. With a dead eye, it's fancy and it's complicated. Please pardon the mess. We're not sailing right now. As you can tell, we are working on the boat. We're planning on sailing tomorrow. So right now what I'm gonna do is get the dead eye tensioned and get that all set. Okay, so with the dead eye, you pass through the lashing, uh, you pass through the end of the stay and then through the dead eye. And for these smaller stays that don't have much load, I like to do four passes. It's really important that when you're doing the passes, that everything lays next to each other. You don't want anything over wrapping or overriding because then when you go to tension it, it uh, it'll just bind up on itself. And now by hand, I'll get most of the slack out before we put it on a winch. So the setup to tension this is pretty straightforward. You have the end of the stay, it comes to the lashings, leads into the dead eye, and here's your purchase system. This all leads into a fair lead, which keeps it completely in line with the stay. You don't want it forward or aft because then as you tension it, you're gonna be tensioning on a triangle and not on a straight line. So straight on, the fair lead then leads all the way to the two winches. And the two winches are back there. One serves as an anchor. The second one serves as the actual working winch. So the smaller one will be the anchor. And then the bigger one is the winch that actually does the work. From a math standpoint, you have a hefty purchase system here, which leads over to there to a two to one. So whatever purchase you have here, it's then doubled. And then that again is multiplied by the winch. So as you can see, you can create some really, really outstanding numbers in here. Now there is going to be loss due to friction. So it's not going to be as perfect as it could be, but it's plenty to get the tension that you need in the rigging. Okay, at this point, you have this side set up, leading all the way back to the winch. And then on the other side of the deck, you have the same shroud. There it is, and it's hooked up and run all the way back to its winches. So the reason you wanna do both sets of shrouds at the exact same time is that way you can get everything tuned and balanced perfectly. Because what's gonna happen is, while you're adjusting, if one shroud is tighter than the other, it's actually gonna pull the mast that way. So if you, if you set one shroud and you do all your work for one side, 
the mask is going to be bent a bit. And then when you do the other side, you have to do it enough that it comes out perfect to straighten the mask out. Now, it can be done, but you're probably going to be back and forth adjusting them a whole bunch of times. And honestly, the longest part in this whole process is setting up and finishing off. So the setup where you have to run all these lines everywhere, that takes a long time. And then at the very end, when you have to tie off the shroud frapping knot to hold the lashings together, that takes a long time. So if you can just do all of it at once, and only once, then it saves a whole bunch of time in the process. So what you want to be looking out for is bending the mast. So depending which stay you're doing, the mast is going to bend in different directions. Right now I'm doing the check stays which oppose our inner force stay. So there isn't really that much bend. They're more tension to keep the mast from pumping when we're in heavy weather flying just the stay sole. So you can see right now the stay is very, very loose. And we want it to be a lot tighter. Uh, this is the lower which is, or the aft lower which is the loosest stay. This one's our second tightest stay. And then the cap shroud is the tightest stay. So we want this guy to be pretty much on par with the cap shroud. So we don't have running back stays. Instead, we just set up the check stays and they're permanently set and they don't get in the way of the boom when we're off the wind and the boom's out really far. So it's nice because we don't have to be constantly setting and dousing running back stays. We just have these that are set up and permanent and we don't have to deal with them. So their tension actually goes close to the same tension as the cap shreds because they kind of act as a cap shred for the, uh, for the inner force day. So let's get that tightened up. So as you can see right now, it's very loose. We're gonna go back to the winches and we're going to tighten them both the same. So the winches are symmetrical. The, uh, the purchase system on the dead eyes is symmetrical. So that means that when I crank on the winch, the tension will feel symmetrical as well. So I go pretty much by feel. I crank this one down and then I'll crank the other one until it feels just as tight. And then I'll go out and check the stay again. This is a lot tighter now. That's much better. Let's check the other side. Also good. Now we check and see if the mast is straight. This side's a little too tight. We need to tighten this one up to make the mast bend more to the right. So this is why it's really good to do them at the same time because now I know that this side needs to be tighter. So I can just come over here and just crank the winch. Now that stays a lot tighter. And we're looking good. Now we just see how the mast is raked. All looks good there. It's all looking good. So with that, the check stays are tight. They're set. And what we're going to do now is tie them off. So we're going to tie a shroud frapping knot into the lashings. We're just going to hold everything in place. That way we can take it off the winches. A lot of times I'm asked, how do you know how tight the stay should be? How is there a loose gauge? Are there other forms of checking the tension on the stay? Yes, they exist, but no, you do not need them. They're very expensive and they tell you nothing of actual importance. Uh, so the, the theory behind tension in, uh, from a loose gauge or something like that is that the, based on the geometry of the stay to the mast, 
it should be perfectly symmetrical, which means that the tension on this stay should be identical to the tension on the other side stay. The truth is, when the boats are being built, nothing is symmetrical. So the tension on this one on paper might be 1500. And then on the starboard side, you'd expect it to also be 1500. But the truth is this one might be 1560 and the other side might be 1480. It, so you can buy those gauges and you can use those gauges, but at the end of the day, the mass still won't be straight and you're gonna have to tune it by eye and by feel anyway. So you might as well learn the feel and then you'll be good to go. So pretty much the, the feel is you give it a tug, that's it. You can tell from pulling on them with practice how that is, how it's doing, and if it needs to be tighter or looser. So the general standard way is the aft lower is the loosest, the forward lower is the next tightest, and then the cap shroud is the tightest. Now check stays are their own thing, they go in line with the inner force stay, so they don't really count with the, the general shroud tension. So check stays, like the ones that we just did, uh, those you set based on the tension that you want on your inner force stay. So if you want more tension on your inner force stay, like we do, because that's our staysail, then you want these tighter. If you want less tension on the inner force stay, you want them looser. So they're pretty much along the lines of tensioning uh, with a back stay, where you set them simply to set the tension that you want on your head stay. Now an important thing to note, right now these are being unopposed by the inner force stay because the inner force stay is still loose. So, this is the tension now. I'm gonna tighten on the inner force stay and you'll see how it tightens down. And it's good. So that is very nice and tight. And I like the inner force stay to be about as tight as the head stay. And that's good. If you have more tension than that, then you're just uh, straining your mast and there's no real purpose to it. So now that that's tight, these are even tighter. These are actually too tight, I don't like it. So. This is the other reason you want to set everything up in symmetry before you tie them off, is right now it's too tight, so we're gonna loosen it. So to loosen them, since you're on a winch, you can slowly ease it off. And if you're wondering why didn't I have the inner force stay set before I tighten the check stays, the answer is physics. It's easier to get tension on something when it's unopposed, and then with that high field lever, I can just clamp it down and it finishes it off. It's uh, similar to a trick to tensioning your cap shrouds. You crank back on the back stay, the mast actually rakes back. The cap shrouds have a shorter distance they have to do. You can tighten them up as tight as you need them. And then when you ease the back stay, the cap shrouds are a lot tighter. So if you just need that little bit of extra tension and don't have the mechanical advantage to get it, those are some little tricks you can do to get it. That's better. That's good. And once again, we check the mass for true. Now when you're checking the mast, you wanna put your chin right up to the tip of the, the base of the mast. And then you lean back and forward again. And the reason is you're looking at it from different angles, but still in line. So if there's an S shape or if something's not right, it'll become very apparent to you. All right, all good. So we got tension on the check stays. We're gonna tie them off with the shroud trapping knot and then we can wrap everything up. 
Okay, we're gonna tie the shroud frapping knot here. Now, if you want a full, very long, very tedious and in-depth video on how to tie the shroud frapping knot, uh, you can find the link in the description down below. But we're gonna do it here and we're just gonna do it really quickly. So this is a knot I came up with about five years ago now. And it's what allows you to have synthetic standing rigging tensioned with a dead eye on a large boat. Before this, you had to either be a very small boat that you could tension by hand, or you needed to use turnbuckles. This knot allows you to uh, have a dead eye, which for the cost conscious people who don't really have the funds to uh, buy turnbuckles, this is great. So. What you're going to be doing is you have the line in here and then you simply wrap along down. You need to have a minimum of 10 wraps and every two to three you're going to tie a marlin spike hitch and pull it nice and tight. How to tie a marlin spike hitch. All right, now let's do that slowly. So first, you're going to make a loop and you're going to lay the loop across the top. Then you pinch it and you roll it over again. Now you take a marlin spike and it goes over, under, and over. So over, under, and over. Then you pull it tight. And now you have a hitch that's tied onto your marlin spike and you can pull really tightly with a lot of force and that'll clamp down and really tighten stuff up. And the beauty of a marlin spike hitch is they pull right out when you're done. So you can get really fancy and tie them with the marlin spike in there. And those are done by placing the marlin spike on the line, wrapping it over, and then taking everything, pulling it back a little bit, slipping it under the piece, and then back over. So you get the same thing, just that you can do it with the marlin spike in your hand. So once you have a bunch of wraps here, minimum 10, but there's no reason you can't do more, they're going to serve to give friction to hold everything together. That's why this is a frapping knot, because you have a bunch of lines that are running along and you're pulling them together with frapping turns. So once again, another marlin spike hitch. Pull that up. Okay, and then the last one goes through again. And with that, you have two passes on each side. So, what happens? The lines are pinched together, and that creates a ton of friction so they can't slide anymore. And then, you put this in, which does a couple things. First, it forces them to be really pinched between the ends and this guy here. So now you have extra friction at the ends. And then secondly, it goes in a opposite direction, so it's perpendicular to the rest of the turns, which means that it's harder for it to come untied. So, with that, that is all set. The last thing to do is to force this guy through behind these because these are really tight and they'll hold everything in place. Now this is a bit of a challenge, I'm not gonna lie. You just work so hard to make it all super tight. <laughs> so 
You don't want to pull it all the way through because you'll never get it out. <laughs> Alright, so now you have this goes through and you have a slip so that if you ever need to retension this in the future, all you have to do is pull here and out it comes. And this end will simply get wrapped around the bottom here. And then passed through under everything and out the other side. Now, the no after this, the next thing is we take this off and then we wrap the ends of this line around the knot because this knot is the one that's actually going to hold the boat and hold the rigging. This knot simply covers it, it's prettier, and it protects this one because if this knot gets chafed, your rigging comes down. If this knot gets chafed, it doesn't really matter. So as you can see here, what looks like the knot that's tying off the rigging is just ornamental. The real knot is inside. Now that it's all tied off up there, we come back here, release the tension. So, the tail comes out at the top, and then I have the other one coming out at the bottom. And this is purely for ornamental reasons. You can have them both come out on the bottom or both on the top. It doesn't matter. Whatever you think is prettier. I just personally like the look of this one, and this is a top and a bottom. So, the top one comes down lower than the middle, and you loop it through itself. And then you pass it outside, like below the other loop, but then you come above it when you go through there, and then you pull it down, and then once again. And this just cinches it down and makes it a little tighter. But, as you know, this is the ornamental knot, so it doesn't really matter. And then a little half hitch, and you're finished. If there's enough of a tail, maybe a second half hitch. There we are. Looks pretty. Alright, this one comes up to just above the top of the top one. And then comes through there and then wraps over it, and do it again, and then a third time. So all this does is it gives it a little bit of tension to keep everything in place, so that way it just looks neater. And then you start wrapping, a bunch of wraps, make them nice and tight, but as always, this is purely ornamental. So you can finish it off however you think looks prettiest. Alright, and that's it. Stays tied off, and you're finished. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And if you'd like to follow our journey in real time on a map, receive postcards from our ports of call, and messages directly to the boat, you can go ahead and become a patron using the link in the description down below. And then, get in here a little better. So the whole thing. Uh, nope, almost. Okay. Yeah.